give a brief intro. Oh yes, <laughs> recording. Um, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the webinar and then we'll jump into the presentation. I'd also like to note we are recording and we'll share the presentation afterwards. So hi, my name is Nadia. I'm from the HealthSec Nation and I am the Wetland Assessment Assistant at BCWF. As the BC Wildlife Federation is a provincial organization, we work and live across what is known as British Columbia and we acknowledge and respect the 203 First Nations who have lived in relationship with and stewarded these lands since time immemorial and continue to do so today. At BCWF, we acknowledge that reconciliation takes time and we are prioritizing building relationships with First Nations communities. BCWF supports Indigenous-led conservation by partnering with First Nations on habitat restoration, education and training, and knowledge sharing opportunities. We're excited to support and work alongside many nations and bands and are grateful to have guidance from elders, knowledge keepers, and community members throughout our work. Today, I'm calling in from the unceded and traditional territory of the Silks people of the Okanagan Nation. If you know whose traditional territory you are currently on, please include it in the chat box, as I know we have people joining from all different places. And if you don't know whose land you're on, I encourage you to make yourself familiar with the Indigenous peoples whose land you occupy. I also want to acknowledge and thank the sponsors and funders who have supported this webinar. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to run events like this free of charge to the public. And we are just so grateful for their support of our programs. I'd like to give a brief overview of the BC Wildlife Federation and the programs we offer. This webinar is being presented through our wetlands education program. Every year, the Wetland Education Program team works to restore, enhance, and conserve wetlands across the province. We offer courses in communities throughout BC to provide knowledge and tools for our participants to be wetland stewards in their own backyards. The Wetland Education Program offers both virtual and in-person workshops, some of which are listed on this slide. The wetland workforce team operates in pods throughout the province and complete maintenance, monitoring, and assessment work at our restoration sites. The BCWF's youth program runs summer camps for the summer and educational programs during the year. We also have the fish habitat restoration and education program, which leads restoration workshops in riparian zones. Additionally, we have our wonderful in-office staff who work to organize our membership and process core certificates, which are needed if you'd like to get a hunting license in BC. If you'd like to know any more of this information, you can visit our website at bcwf.bc.ca. For ease of this webinar, please keep yourself muted to avoid background noise during the presentation. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat and we will keep a list of questions for the end of the presentation, or they may be answered in the chat. My colleague Kendall is on the call if you need any tech assistance and she'll also be monitoring the chat. And now I'll pass it off to Neil, who's our Director in Con of Conservation and Stewardship to say a few words. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, appreciate uh, the intro uh, to this morning and happy World Wetlands Day, everyone. Um, uh, I've asked Nadia to prov provide a few additional slides after I say hello here uh, to set the stage for today's talk. Um, I had recently just come from a conference where there was a lot of younger, um, younger people uh, just entering the workforce uh, and people that were still in high school. And what really struck me was um, anxiety around climate change and the feeling of hopelessness, the feeling of a lot of things that are uh, coming to front uh, these these days. And um, we wanted to offer hope 
uh, in, in these in these times. And uh, Nadia is going to provide a bit of a context of why why I think there is this climate emergency. And, and hopefully, and after that, we're going to hear from both uh, Norm Allard, uh, who we've worked with uh, closely over the last few years in uh, the Creston area on a, a project that Norm will speak to, as well as uh, uh, Jen Rogers. She's, she's part of our team and is our beaver restoration lead. Uh, so both of them have some, hopefully some stories and some, some actions that can be taken uh, in response to our climate crisis. So I, I welcome you here today. I look forward to the conversations uh, after the presentation that we might have with you. And uh, thank you for attending. Back to you, Nadia. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, so as I'm sure everyone is aware, we have seen many extreme weather events, such as the floods from the atmospheric river in 2021, and then fires that burned throughout the province, which hurt critical habitats, people's homes and communities. We understand this can cause a lot of climate anxiety, as Neil mentioned, and it makes us worry about what the future will look like and if enough will be done in order to prevent this from becoming our new normal. We hope this webinar will inspire hope and spark discussion as we share how wetland restoration helps communities adapt to droughts and floods. Wetland pre protection and restoration is a critical step in mitigating the impacts of extreme weather events. Today is World Wetlands Day, and the goal of today is to highlight how all aspects of human well-being, physical, mental, and environmental, are tied to the health of the world's wetlands. And as Neil mentioned, presenting today, we have Jennifer Rogers, who is our Beaver Restoration Assessment Lead, and Norm Allard, who works as a community planner for the Lower Kootenai Band. And now I will hand it off to Norm. Thanks again for joining. Happy World Wetlands Day. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about the project that we've got going on and some of the stuff we've done to help combat against climate change and kind of mitigate those effects that we're starting to feel. And a little bit about how, you know, I felt throughout the whole process. So as mentioned, I'm a uh, community planner for Lower Kootenai Band. And this section here is, uh, this is a photo of what's referred to as the hunting grounds. The traditional name is Anakam Namke. It's where the people would hunt. Um, that's what it means. These wetlands were floodplain in floodplain wetlands. And they were such a rich, diverse area that when they were having problems finding some food or other resources in other areas, the wetlands always provided um, a backup plan. It was their ace in the hole for when they needed either food or materials, say for in hard times during like uh, the dead of winter when it's super cold out and frosty and everything's hunkered down and hard to find, the wetland would be chock full of burbot they'd chip through the ice and they'd find them there. The berbert usually spawn within, uh, they call them the Valentine's Day fish. They spawn, do their spawning events around then and they ball up so they'd actually go and they'd be able to peel them off or either spear, spear some off of these, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, spawning balls, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was a huge rich resource. And over time, that became well known as like a really good area for farming. If you're able to um, disconnect these systems from the river and keep them dry enough, you could farm them. You could see on the north side here, um, I'll switch back and forth. This was full of large wetlands here and through diking and draining, they turned it into really rich farmland. 
but luckily enough on reserve in this area um it's it was a huge cultural part of their identity wetlands so they decided to preserve some of these areas and they partnered with um ducks unlimited back in the late mid to late 60s to turn these into impoundments which unfortunately disconnected them from the river system and back then this was cutting edge technology and ducks has changed drastically since then but the idea over you know around 50 years ago was to turn these into nesting areas and in order to do that you'd need to keep the floodplain uh, free from flooding you'd have to keep all of that water out of here so um, they put in a two kilometer dam on this impoundment and they connected all of these historical wetlands with ditching and turned all of the spoil piles into what was supposed to be nesting mounds and in doing so um, they hit permeable layers there's sand lenses throughout this whole area and these water these areas didn't hold water like they were intended to. So what we've done is we've gone through, uh, we started these projects back in 2017 and this work, um, we actually um, managed to get to this area in 2019. And since then we've taken all of these green and red dots with, with the huge nesting mounds and restored the rims of these massive areas. We're doing landscape scale restoration. We disabled all of that draining and took out the dam that surrounded this area and reconnected portions of the stream that had been redirected. So um, this is just standing on top of one of these dikes that we took out one of these dams. And the only function that remained the same over the years as was that it kept the floodwaters out. And as you can see, we're, I'm looking at a large piece of driftwood that exists on the outside of the wetland, the floodplain that naturally would have went in and drifted into these areas. And in doing so, they created these borrow pits along the whole area. Um, and they'd use this to make these dams and within these borrow pits, they hit those permeable layers. So this is actually on the outside, but the ones that they created on the inside, they dug them, took dirt from both sides. That would actually cause the water to seep out underneath these dams that were meant to hold the water in. And these large wetland areas that you can see that historically held water year round, by August, they'd dry up and they'd end up looking like this, minimal vegetation in the center. And then it'd get greener around towards the other, along the edges of these massive wetlands. So by August, this is that area that we we're looking at. It'd end up being dry because all of that water would seep out and it wouldn't be held back. If you think of floodplain wetlands like um, tide pools, if you connect them all with ditching and the tide is the spring runoff, the freshet, when the tide comes in and there's all that ditching there, all the water will end up flowing back out because of that ditching. So by restoring the rims of these massive wetlands and redigging a number of historical ones that existed, um, we disabled that ditching and now when freshet comes in, the water within these basins stays behind as the water recedes after freshet's finished. So this is a look at what it was like in August before we had done the project. And then this is what it looks like in the spring now, every spring. We managed to reconnect this whole area to the river system so that it we're mimicking that historical flooding event, which is recharging this whole area. Some of these wetlands under normal um, monitoring practices, if you're lucky, you'd get two years worth of monitoring after the project was finished. 
some of these larger areas, it took them three to four years before they were holding water. So taking longer looks at these places is uh, what we're trying to start doing. I've, we're just finishing up a five-year monitoring portion and with other projects I've managed to tack on another five years. So we're gonna have a 10-year look at this place. My dream is to have a 20-year look to kind of see and fully understand what's starting to happen with these areas. So this is the spring, just after fresh it had start going down, you can see in the bottom here, um, this was some fresh uh, restoration. We just finished digging, digging this wetland here and a bunch of other ones in the fall before. So, and if you go back, um, that was this wetland right here. So the view is looking from, you're looking from the left to the right and you can see all of these light green ones were the last work that we did in 2021 in these areas. This is the most complete portion. This is about um, 180 hectares and we're working on 517 hectares of wetland. This is one of four sites that we're restoring. So when you look at that, um, you can see these areas that used to dry up there's a huge oxbow wetland within there that wouldn't hold water all year long. It'd dry up and it'd look like that one photo. So key thing is, this is what it looks like in the spring when it's flooded or just after flooding. So how much of an effect did we have on this throughout the year? So if I don't have this similar photo, I couldn't find it in time. But if you think of this set, look at the center portion of it, this is what it looks like in August now, after a dry heat with only two days of rain throughout the summer. High temps, everything is hammering away at these areas. And through the restoration work, they're holding way more amounts of water than we'd ever hoped they would. These areas, like I mentioned before, by the beginning of August would have been dry by now. And this is mid-August. Oh, sorry, my my headphone shut off without any sound. So um, that little beep that I heard myself was freaking me out. But yeah, these uh, these areas are holding massive amounts of water. So just through like, you know, continual work on these areas, we're able to show that um, it took decades for them to become degraded. And it's gonna take a, a number of years before we start to really understand how well the restoration work we are doing is um, affecting these areas. And like I mentioned before, we're working on 517 hectares of floodplain wetland. That's massive, but you know, I even I had that anxiety, that freaking uh, I was freaked out about it. Like this isn't enough. I kept looking like provincially, you know, there's so much land. Nationally, there's so much land. You look at the world, and it's just like, you know, I'm not doing enough. <laughs> even working on this massive amount of stuff, I felt like I wasn't doing enough to actually make a difference. And it wasn't until like, you know, um, ECWF came along and we had that awesome year where the wetlands workforce came about and we we're able to connect all of these projects happening that I realized it wasn't a matter of how much am I doing individually, how, how it's not up to me just to save everything. It's up to all of us. We're all doing all of these projects across the province and it's additive. It doesn't matter what size you're working on. It's adding to, it, you're bolstering the environment. The world needs all of these projects happening everywhere, whether it's landscape scale, all the way down to a few hectares or a small pond. Just north of here is the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area where the leopard frog is in danger. 
um, you know, it doesn't matter the amount of work I'm doing down here. If somebody came along and created, um, a, it's about 10 kilometers away. So if they came in and put in four or five smaller wetlands between here and there, they've opened up a huge corridor for that uh, leopard frog. They need about one to two kilometers between wetlands to travel. They've reopened that up. So it doesn't matter the size of project you're working on. As long, what matters is that you're doing something, you know, finding all of these amazing events that are happening, getting your door in or foot in the door, but volunteering on some of them, you know, getting that experience. Um, you can always see, you know, Kendall does a lot of stuff, uh, promotions of things, events and everything on, you know, places like LinkedIn or Facebook. You can always see all these things, look for local events. You know, I mentioned um, I have a video out, which I didn't want to show today because it's more important to talk a bit about the experience of it. In the video, I mentioned, you know, what can we do to help? And I say, you do what you can. And that's what makes a difference. It's like, it's like straight out of a movie. You know, people are, you always see that moment where it's like, they look at the camera, like, it's up to you. <laughs> and it is, it's up to you. Whether um, you're watching this or people you know, it's a matter of creating the, um, chance to engage in this restoration work. That's what's going to help the world, in my opinion. So, yeah. So that's our work. Um, if you're interested, I'll find the link and put it in the chat to the video. You can check them out later on. Um, and this has all been, you know, possible by a lot of really, um, great partnerships which wouldn't have happened otherwise um because of bcwf and the work that they do in connecting everybody you know they're they're an amazing leader in wetland restoration and a great resource to actually point you in a good direction if you are looking into getting into some of this stuff and i think that's time or do I need to ramble some more? <laughs> I'll take up the whole time if you let me, but I, I have to share today. <laughs> I'll just hop in for a sec. Thank you so much, Norm, for that. And uh, if you could, if you have a link to your video, I think you launched today, if I'm not mistaken, uh, please drop it in the chat for everyone to, to find uh, for later today. And, um, uh, without further ado, I think we'll uh, we'll go over to Jen for Jen's presentation and then uh, have a formal part for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for your talk, Norm. Can you see my screen? I can't see that. Yes, okay, yes, it works. Sweet. <laughs> I can't see that green box anymore. Um, but my name is Jen Rogers, and I'm calling today from the traditional and ceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including Coquitlam, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And I work as the Beaver Restoration Assessment Lead with the BC Wildlife Federation, which is definitely the coolest job title I've ever had. Um, and I've been working with them for just under a year and with the main focus on connecting groups and supporting and implementing beaver-based restoration projects throughout BC. And so this talk is specifically focused on using beaver-based restoration as a nature-based landscape scale climate adaptation and mitigation strategy. Uh, but first, just to get a state, okay, just to set the stage, um, here are some of the headlines that we've been seeing in the news recently, highlighting devastating fires, floods, and droughts. And I'm sure, like was mentioned earlier today, this is the root of a lot of anxiety. And it's pretty obvious that something needs to be done on a large scale to help recover and build resilience to these disturbances. 
And there does seem to be a shifting mind frame and a shifting management framework to help address some of these issues. Uh, so these climate driven disturbances, they can initiate these feedback loops that lead further and further into degradation. And so an example of this would be intense fires that remove the canopy and ground cover. This then leads to increased runoff and erosion, which contributes to greater magnitude floods. And then the power of the water that's coming down streams during these floods can then erode the stream banks and the stream bed and lead to the channel cutting into itself, which then disconnects the stream from its floodplains and lowers the groundwater table around it because the water isn't able to flow over the banks and percolate into the soil. And so this decrease in water tables also leads to more intense drought conditions, which can then make landscapes more susceptible to those intense fires. And so this cycle is really destructive and has had a lot of devastating impacts um, on communities. And it's put a lot of stress on human infrastructure that's been designed to control and entrain water because either these structures are old or they just weren't designed to withstand this magnitude of disturbance. Uh, but there is an opportunity to turn to natural infrastructure higher in the watershed to promote floodplain connection, like Norm was mentioning, uh, in order to build climate resilience and recover from degradation. And so these, some of these approaches like beaver-based restoration may be most appropriate higher in the watershed, whereas human engineered structures are still important and needed lower in the watershed, where there are lots of roads and communities that are present in the floodplain. Um, but this top-down approach can top-down approach can really help improve conditions lower in the watershed over time. And so with this in mind, here are some other headlines that you might have seen in the news recently, citing beavers as these really amazing climate-saving heroes. But you may be wondering, what makes beavers so special and who gives a damn? but it's actually their dams that make them so unique. And so beavers are known to be ecosystem engineers because they build these vast networks of dams and they dig canals and this creates pools and activates side channels and creates these really complex and diverse habitats. Beavers can also be seen as hydrologists because these dams are able to store water, uh, spread it across the floodplain and sink it into the ground water tables. Uh, beaver dams are also like sponges and they can extend the hydro period because they retain water during those high flow periods and slowly release it downstream, being able to supplement those uh, summertime low flows. Beavers are also a keystone species as they create these diverse and complex habitats that are used by a wide variety of organisms everywhere from fish to plants to mammals to birds to insects to reptiles. Uh, beavers and beaver modified habitats have been found to improve biodiversity, species richness, and productivity, not just in those areas that they are building dams, but also within the entire watershed. And finally, beavers are a historically important species. They really helped shape the landscape of North America and there was an estimated 40 to 600 million beavers in the continent before European colonization. And then they were almost hunted to extinction during the fur trade. And this kind of initiated what is known by some geomorphologists as the Great Drying, where an estimated 80% of wetlands were lost between the 1600s and the 1900s. And because of how important beaver dams are to watershed health, the loss of beavers and those beaver engineered wetlands can be recognized as a large landscape scale disturbance. And although beaver populations are rebounding, they are obviously nowhere near historic levels. And so by building dams, beavers can enhance resilience to floods uh, as the dams attenuate peak flow and therefore can help dampen flood waves. Without beavers, flood events are mainly confined within the channel and they result in bank erosion, scouring, and the loss of soil as water is rushed through the systems. Uh, when beavers build dams and canals in a stream, those side channels and off channels are created upstream, and this provides alternative flow paths for floodwaters, and that really helps to dissipate the water volume and velocity that's associated with a flood event. 
And since beaver dams and beaver channels help slow the water and spread it across the landscape, there's also more time for it to soak into the ground and raise groundwater levels, which helps enhance resilience to droughts. Uh, in drought conditions, vegetation relies heavily on groundwater. And so by increasing groundwater storage, we're allowing riparian plants to maintain access to water under these really harsh conditions. And in addition to enhancing actual groundwater, a study in Alberta found that um, beavers increased the amount of open water habitat by ninefold during times of drought, which is pretty significant. And similarly, since there is a lot more lush green vegetation that's near beaver ponds due to those higher groundwater tables, the vegetation doesn't burn as easily as does the nearby dry vegetation. So if a fire comes through, it will usually take the path of least resistance and burn through the dry vegetation away from the beaver pond. And so this can create some critical uh, refuge habitat for wildlife that's seeking shelter during intense fires. And these long stretches of beaver modified floodplains can also create some speed bumps to slow the spread of fire that could allow humans to contain fires before they become out of control. And so here's just a visual of how effective beavers are at creating these fire breaks. And there's a study that found that riparian zones with beaver activity were three times less affected by wildfires compared to riparian zones without beaver activity. And there's also a relatively new idea that beavers can help systems recover after a fire. A lot of the sediment that's mobilized, the first rain, intense rain event after a fire, can be trapped behind beaver dams, which improves downstream water quality and also, like we we're talking about before, acts as speed bumps to slow the flow of water and prevent more scouring and degradation downstream. And so I think this graphic summarizes the beaver's role in climate strategies really well. Um, on the left, we have a riverscape without beaver, and it can easily fall into those feedback loops of degradation that we discussed earlier in the presentation. So the riverscapes are more susceptible to the symptoms of climate change and more likely to move into a degraded state. Whereas on the right, we have a riverscape with beaver dams or beaver-based structures that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and these structures are able to improve the hydrologic conditions to mitigate the symptoms of climate change by improving surface water and groundwater interactions and attenuating flows. And so this leads to a system that's able to adapt and recover from disturbance and pushing away from that feedback loop that leads to further degradation and moving towards another path of resilience and recovery from disturbance. And so you may be wondering that, that all sounds great, uh, but how do we get beavers into these areas that we want them? And that's where beaver-based restoration comes in. And it's part of a suite of restoration called low-tech process-based restoration named so because it focuses on restoring those natural processes to build watershed resilience, and it doesn't involve the use of heavy equipment or expensive engineered designs. So beaver-based restoration can really involve a combination of strategies to either mimic or promote beaver establishment, including constructing beaver dam analogs or BDAs, planting riparian vegetation to encourage beaver establishment, or relocating beavers to project sites. And as a quick overview, BDAs are channel spanning structures that are designed to mimic the form and function of natural beaver dams. And so humans are essentially building like a beaver to either encourage beaver establishment or to uh, create conditions ideal for beavers to eventually move in. And so they are typically constructed with a handheld hydraulic post pounder that you can see in the image there. And so it is typically driving untreated wooden posts into the stream bed and then weaving locally sourced vegetation as the fill material. And taking a note from how beavers actually build their dam in the wild, there's usually a mattress downstream of the dam uh, and a cobble and sediment that's packed on the upstream face of the dam. And these are both strategies to help limit scouring around the dam and increase the, the lifespan of the dam. Uh, I'll also note that there is no one way to build a BDA. There's many iterations. This is just one of them. It tends to be the most popular one, um, but you can build them without the use of posts. 
um, and you can really adapt it based on the conditions at your site and your restoration objectives. Um, and then just a few caveats on the use of BDAs. You are typically wanting to construct multiple within a stream reach. This is both to mimic how beavers build their dams naturally in the wild and also to just increase the overall resilience of the, the system. It's not just relying on one structure, it's relying on the interactions between multiple structures. And this grouping of structures is often called a complex. Um, another thing to note is that these are temporary and they are not meant to be permanent fixes. So it's really there to kickstart the recovery. And then ideally beavers will be moved in or translocated in to maintain the structures and expand upon the restoration area. Um, if beavers are not present in the stream reach, the structures do require seasonal maintenance. And another note is just that BDAs are not appropriate everywhere. Um, they're a great tool, but they can't be used um, in all sites. And so the best sites are typically low risk sites that have a minimal chance of conflict. So that would be limited surrounding infrastructure and having willing landowners. These sites also tend to be low gradient as they have wider floodplains typically and the lower gradient means that there's less stress placed on the structures from stream power. Um, and also obviously we want sites where there's a restoration benefit. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. So um, highlighting air degraded areas where we can really kickstart that recovery process. And so with all that said, um, how is beaver-based restoration being applied in BC? Um, it's definitely gaining a lot of momentum here. It's been a growing restoration technique that's been used in the States for many years, and there's been a lot of really great studies showing its effectiveness, uh, but it's still very new to BC. There are a lot of groups that have shown interest in using beavers as a restoration tool, and that I am aware of. There is over 20 First Nations communities, environmental organizations, government organizations, and academic institutions that are interested in the, pursuing this type of restoration work to build watershed resilience. And some of these groups have already completed some projects across BC. From a regulatory standpoint, the provincial regulators are aware of this rising momentum and they are working towards establishing a regulatory framework to help permit these projects. Um, this will take some time, but we are um, on the path forward. So I'm very hopeful that we'll have some standardized approaches to regulations very soon. Um, as well, BCWF has actually received federal funding to support these projects and to build capacity within communities and within organizations to carry out this restoration, as well as monitor its effectiveness. And so we have committed to supporting we're implementing the construction of 100 BDAs by the end of 2025. And so we are moving in the right direction to nature-based solutions as one of the tools in an array of tools within the toolbox to improve resilience to climate change and to restore ecosystem health. Um, our riverscapes really do deserve protection and restoration and using beavers or beaver mimicry is a great way to do that. And so here are a ton of amazing resources. Um, they are just a few, um, but if you're interested in learning more, um, I highly recommend um, looking into these. And that's about all I have. I think um, both Norm and I would be happy to take any questions that people might have in the chat. Yeah, there is a question. A do BDA require permitting and are plans being made to add this to the list of the WSA notifications? Yes, BDAs do require permits. Um, anything added into a stream would require a permit. We're in talks with government regulators to figure out what exactly that permitting path might be, whether it's a water license or whether it's a section 11 change approval the type of permit that you might need is really going to depend on what your what you have downstream what are the potential risks um and what would be the potential consequences if um your dam were to breach 
Okay, another question got added. Have we seen any natural beavers moving into BDAs in BC? Um, in, in general, beavers have moved into BDA locations and have built upon BDAs and expanded them. In BC, um, the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology constructed some outside of Merritt, and there was beavers that were translocated to that site, and the beavers have stayed there and built upon um, the beaver dam analogs, which is exciting. There's another one. How is fish passage incorporated into BDAs or are they not suited suitable in fish bearing streams? That's a good question. That's also a very hot topic of debate. I Maybe I wouldn't say debate, but it's a very common thing that's brought up with beaver dam analogs. And they have been shown to be passable to fish, um, to juveniles, specifically steelhead and coho. Um, the, the way that we're trying to look at rolling out beaver dam analogs in the province is by looking higher in the watershed, typically where there are less fish. Um, this is just our strategy, um, at the beginning, but beavers, um, fish have been known to be able to pass natural beaver dams by using those alternative flow paths or going through little gaps within the dam itself. Um, in terms of beaver dam analogs themselves, there has been studies that show that they are passable to both juvenile and adults um, during the time of year that they are actually um, moving through the system. And so it's something that can use further research with a variety of different types of fish species, um, but it is something that, uh, that beaver dam analogs can help improve fish habitat and also maintain upstream and downstream migration within the streams that they are built. Okay, this question's for Norm. Can you let us know a little bit more about the floodplain reconnection project, uh, Burbit release, perhaps how your experience at LKB has opened up floodplain reconnection projects in other areas? I can't hear you for some reason, or I'm not sure. I'm double muted. I got mute on my mic as well <laughs> yeah um we are partnered with the kootenai tribe of idaho who does who has a fisheries operation that releases uh burbot and sturgeon within the creston valley it's a cross-border initiative from the states all the way up and we've started releasing burbot larvae post feeding within the wetlands themselves because of uh, that historical knowledge, the indigenous knowledge that we rely on for heavily for these projects are, like I said, some of those stories of them existing within the wetland during winter months means that um, they were a part of the system when they first hatch along with salmon or the kokanee here. Um, is usually around freshet time. Uh, salmon will spawn in the fall and then the reds will exist until freshet comes along. And they usually, when they first hatch out, they're microscopic and they're, they, they go wherever the water will take them. That first place usually is the wetland floodplain areas where there's a, up to a 10 degree in, uh, differential in temperature, it's warmer, there's abundant food for them. It's a, a rearing habitat for these fish, which um, as the freshet 
comes and goes and exits the system, they also wash out the other end with tons of food. Whereas when you disconnect these floodplains from those systems, um, which is like a, a part of the way that she was talking, that Jen was mentioning, um, that these are different areas for the fish to get around these dams and enter the system. Um, when these close off, they get washed into the system with that food, and some of them get trapped behind throughout the season, which feeds a lot of other things of concern, like the um, fish entrapment's a big concern for some organizations, but they're also starting to worry about things like the great blue heron, which is disappearing off of a lot of floodplains because there isn't enough fish trapped within the system for them to feed on. Now that we've reopened these areas, we're starting to see sandhill cranes. We went from one breeding pair of blue herons, and now we're seeing up to 12 of them within this one portion of wetland we reconnected. We're watching to see if they reestablish a heron rookery there. All of these things are connected together, and that's what we bring with our view of the world. As Indigenous people, we say everything's connected. The fish are a huge portion of the floodplain. The health of the streams and rivers around them directly affect um, whether or not um, fish have this, their survivability rates. Without the floodplain, and it being disconnected, they're born into a colder system with less food, where they're so they don't they have to swim farther in a colder environment and they end up dying before they get food. Whereas putting them back into these areas where they would naturally rear and it would bolster their chances um, is showing great improvement in terms of restoring fish populations which in turn leads to every, everything else being bolstered. When we get funding, we get it for the listed species, but we don't build just for that specific animal, plant, or invertebrate, or whatever we get the funding for. We build it for everything out there because we based our design and our thought on those historical ways of knowing these areas and we believe that building it for everything is going to bolster everything and it's not going to be um, we don't look for things and we're not looking at our successes as static numbers that continually rise for listed species every year we know that there was uh, there were good years and bad years for everything out there when something was having a bad year, something else is having a good year. And those populations would rise and fall in turn. So we look for those cycles to come back and see. Um, we look towards whether or not the area in general is being taken back under nature's care rather than us managing the system. Because that's kind of a huge thing that got us into this mess in the first place. Sorry, I told you I ramble. That was great, Thank you, Norm. thanks Norm. Um, another question for both Jen and Norm, what advice would you give to people who want to make an impact with their own community to find opportunity to affect change? How could they connect with you? Great question. Uh, I can go first. Um, I can put my email in the chat for anybody that wants to know more or if um, you are interested in doing a beaver-based restoration project um, in your communities, but I would also just recommend um, using social media and seeing what's out there. Like Norma's mentioning about 
Kendall posting a lot on LinkedIn about opportunities that are in her community. Um, there are a lot of both funding opportunities and volunteer opportunities to um, lead or join or support a lot of really great restoration projects um, covering an array of things, whether you're most into wetlands or wildlife or um, whales, whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot of um, organizations and projects that are out there and that are eager to have um, support in whatever capacity um, you're able to provide. Yeah, I'd also say like, look up your local conservation areas as well. Like we have the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area here where every year during nesting season, they uh, turtle nesting season, they put out a call to rebuild the uh, um, protective fences for these turtles so they don't, um, they end up crossing a road and part of it is also recreating a lot of signage and everything around the event. And they often ask for volunteers to come out to things like that. Um, organizations like uh, in here, they have CECUS, which is the Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society, where they have um, events where they go out and do weed pulls. They attack a lot of these invasive plants and, you know, things like BCWF too does a lot of um, different projects all across the province. They're, that's why I say they're a really good organization to look into, check out their socials. Um, and also things like uh, local conservation groups, like there's the Friends of the Kootenai Lake. They usually do beach cleanups, anything like that. You know, there's also um, Christmas bird counts, which help really well. Like there's a really huge call these days for, um, what do they call that again? Um, community science or something. I forget what it's called, but where you're actually collecting a bit of data that goes towards, helps a lot a huge amount with different efforts that are going on across the province. So there's tons of ways to get involved. And like I said, even just doing a bit of volunteer work, the more people doing it, the more that it gets added on. It's not just you're doing one small thing. You're actually, you know, you're contributing a great deal. I want to take this moment to thank uh, both of our presenters today, uh, Norm and Jen, uh, for taking the time to share with us uh, some hope uh, around conservation work. I also want to thank Kendall, Nadia, for uh, helping to coordinate this event. Uh, Norm contacted me via text a couple of weeks ago and said, what are you doing for World Wetlands Day? And uh, our team was able to pull together this uh, this webinar relatively quickly from that point on. So thank you to the, my team. Uh, thank you for all that have listened. Um, these are really inspirational stories, uh, some that we like to share uh, with our community of practitioners, as well as those that are interested in supporting conservation work and uh, just wonderful work that, uh, uh, that you've shared with us today. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, I hope this is a feel good Friday moment for those. And again, I hope you go out and celebrate uh, with a, you know, a wetland visit in the winter time uh, this February 2nd. So thank you so much everyone uh, for the time. And again, thanks to the team for pulling this together.
now for the awkward moment. So, so if anybody has any other questions, feel free just to chat. And I guess we'll just close off at uh, 1230, so four, four minutes. But uh, this is the after party for the <laughs> team here. <laughs>